Rightio. Um, we started talking a couple of weeks ago about discipleship, and I also rolled into that. Uh, I mentioned that I wanted to do a series of talks on, and I was going to title them, I wish he never said that. And I want to talk about all the things that Jesus said, but when you and I read them in the Bible, we go, I wish he never said that. Because the fact that he said that means now I have to think about that, I have to wrestle with that, I have to try to understand that. And then I realized that most of the things that I wish he hadn't said all were statements about this thing called discipleship. So I've rolled the whole thing into one, and we're going to be talking about discipleship, and at the same time, all these things that I wish he never said. So last week we began uh, looking at Matthew 13, and we looked at uh, the parable of the, the, the pearl of great price, and we looked at the, the man that found a treasure in a field, and we spent a bit of time, and we talked about the value that was seen in that uh, pearl, and the value that was seen in that treasure. Now, I just want to say this. Today, I want to move on to another saying of Jesus, but I just want to preface by stating why I'm doing that. It appears that there's no topic in church life that brings as much of a reaction from people than the topic of... Be more specific. Discipleship. Disciples deal with a whole bunch of areas. What's one of the things they deal with? Wow. Wow. Yes, someone had the guts to say it. Money. <laughs> money, money, money. Oh, money, money, money. Abba. So I want to move on. I want to talk about a statement that Jesus made to a guy that we know as the rich young ruler. Before I do, I just want to, want to say something. And I don't want to show of hands, but it's interesting how often when we talk about different parables and things in the Bible, that anything that talks about value or talks about exchange, it's so easy for us in our brains to go to a place of finance. I don't know why we do that. We go straight to a place of money. And last week when I was talking about the, the pearl of great price and the man that found a treasure buried in a field, I know from conversations I had uh, that, that some people were, were, were kind of looking at that parable, and rightly so, talking about how it was an exchange of value, one thing, a uh, 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 value for another, and that when, when you have something and an opportunity comes up to have something better, then you make the exchange. And that's kind of how business works, and that's how we go with finances. We exchange this for something of greater value, and that's how we get ahead in life and so on. But I just want to start by saying, please understand that when Jesus taught the parables... He had a primary intention, a primary meaning that ties back to the context and everything around it that he's talking about. And then, of course, there are secondary meanings that we can take out of that because the Holy Spirit can take anything in this book and use it to speak to you about any area of your life. I do believe that. Uh, I, I, there are times where uh, you'll preach a message and afterwards somebody will say, I got this out of that, and, I'll, and they'll just be raving at me, what a fantastic message, and I'll be nodding my head and, and, and taking all the praise and going, that's awesome. And then in my mind going, I didn't even say any of that. What are you talking about? Who are you listening? Oh, this must be John Cameron from Arise Church in New Zealand. That's who you are listening because he's way better than me. But uh, it's amazing what the Holy Spirit can do. But I just want to say that that parable last week, it's actually sandwiched between two other parables. It's unmistakably talking about our hearts and our place in the kingdom of God. It's not talking about your possessions and money and things like that. It's talking about our relationship to God. The parable before it talks about uh, 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 separating weeds and, and good grass and so on. The parable after it talks about throwing a net into the ocean, bringing in the fish, separating the good fish and the bad. And Jesus says this is what it's going to be like at the end when God separates the righteous from the unrighteous. It's going to happen at some point. So I just want to preface by saying that... that, that when we read the parables of Jesus, we, we need to understand that there is a primary motive for what he's saying, and it's tied up in the context of what he's talking about. But that does not nullify that there are secondary uh, lessons and other things we can learn out of it. But last week, the parable we talked about, he's talking about our hearts and our relationship to God and the kingdom of God. It's interesting because all that had to happen for, for, for even though it's a parable, it's a made-up story, all that has to happen for that parable to be unrealistic or to not become a story is that man to look at that pearl and not see the value in the pearl. Now, does that mean the pearl didn't have value? 
course not. The pearl had value whether he saw it or not, but it was his ability to recognize the value that allowed him to engage and join in the process of being a part of the value of that pearl. And that's what it's like for us in the area of discipleship. We have to see the value of being a disciple of Jesus. If we don't see the value of being a follower of Jesus, we'll never be prepared to make the exchanges in our life that need to be made. We just simply won't do it. And so my prayer is that as we go through this over the coming, who knows how long, I don't want to rush it, but that we, the Holy Spirit opens our eyes that we would see the value, the incredible value of being a disciple of Jesus and understand that the exchange of life is not to have your life that you have now, God's intention is not to make it worse. It's not to make it less fulfilling. It's not to make it more boring. Who knows who's boring, Christian? God's intention is never to take away those things from your life. He might change circumstances. He might change situations. He might change things. But whatever he changes and you, he asks you to exchange with him for, you always get the best end of the bargain. You always come out on top in this area of discipleship. So I just want to say that and, 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 and sort of lay that foundation. Mark chapter 10. If you can turn with me to Mark chapter 10. <laughs> now this, this is probably one of the biggest statements that I wish Jesus never said. And I wouldn't have to stand here and wrestle with it and think about it in the context of my own life. I'm not going to get through this whole thing this week. Maybe next week I'll finish up on this particular point. But we want to get started this week. Mark chapter 10 verse 17 to 22. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Now, this same story is also uh, recorded in Luke 18 and Matthew 19. So if you put the three stories together, that's where we come up with the phrase, the rich young ruler. Because the three different writers who are, are telling the same story from different perspectives, they add something to the story. So we know that the guy was rich. We know that he had money. He had possessions. He had wealth. We know that he was young. He had youth on his side, so he's probably got energy and, and, and so on. And we also know that he was a ruler of some sort. So he had position, he had influence, uh, he had a platform that a lot of people would have wanted. It's like those three things are what people chase these days, isn't it? Nobody wants to get old. We want to Botox and we want to straighten and we want to lift and we, we, we want to do everything so that we look younger and younger and younger. Is that, oh, no, don't put your hands up. But that, that's, that's what society tells us. Owen, I knew you'd had work done. So that's what society tells us. You know, younger, and this guy's got it. And then wealth, if you just have money and you can go anywhere and do anything and buy anything and so on, well, that's kind of really good and, and that's what the world tells us will make you fulfill when he's got it. And then he's a ruler, so he's got authority and he's got a bit of power and so on. And then that's what we want in life. If you can get authority and power and so on, then you'll kind of have it made and you're on a good path and a good wicket. Well, here's this man, he's got all three of those things that our society tells us we should chase after, yet he comes to Jesus with an interesting question. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, why do you call me good? The word used there, good, is not just you're a good person. Basically, this guy's acknowledging that there's something of God in your life. That's why Jesus says, why do you call me good? That, that word's reserved for him. Are you acknowledging that there's some God in my life? There's something of God here. Maybe I am who I say I am. Maybe I am the Son of God. He says, You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud, honour your father and mother. Now listen to his response. Teacher, he declared, All these I have kept since I was a baby. He obviously wasn't there when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, sorry, did you hear murder as you... Ah, ah, ah. Do you hate anybody? Whoops. Sorry, do you think adultery is in you've gone off with it? Oh, hang on, have you, has your brain wandered? Have you, have you pictured the Sorry. He obviously wasn't at the Sermon on the Mount. But I'm going to say that I think this guy is serious about God. He knows the commandments. He's, 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 he's probably a very good person. And he's genuinely got money. And he's gone and chased after uh, uh, power and position and prestige and he's got a degree of it. He's got youth on his side. He's also ticking all the religious boxes and doing all the religious stuff. So he's a good person. Jesus says this. He says, one thing you lack. He said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. Oh, I wish he didn't say that. Go sell everything and give it to the poor. You're kidding, Jesus. 
But he said it. It's right here. All three of the gospel writers tell us that's what he said. It wasn't a misinterpretation. I wish one of them had said, and we think he said, go sell some of your stuff. But they all agree. Go sell everything, give to the poor. And you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And this man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. One of the other writers actually says that he said to Jesus, I did all that. What else do I lack? What else do I lack? He's got all the money. He's got the fame, the fortune, the popularity, the following. He's, he's, he's ticking the religious boxes. He's got everything. But he's saying to Jesus, I'm still lacking something. There's something missing in my life. And Jesus said to him on the surface, if you sell everything, give it to the poor, you'll be lacking nothing. Is that what Jesus is saying? That's what it looks like on the surface. Here's what I want to do for the next few minutes. I want to ask three questions. And then I'm going to answer those three questions. So they're rhetorical. You don't have to answer me. But I'm going to answer three questions very quickly in the next few minutes. Question number one. Does God call every believer to sell all they have and give it to the poor? Now, if he does, then I'm in a room of a bunch of unfollowing, heathenistic, self-centered individuals. Hands up if that's you. Oh, oh, I got one hand went up. Let's pray for that person right now. Something's going on. Of course you're not. You love God. You got a heart for God. You want to follow God. So, my question: Does God call every believer to sell all they have and give it to the poor? Are they all living an absolutely disobedient life right now? Or God doesn't call everybody to do it? Or three, you're just not listening, and He is. I don't know. It's between you and God. But let me show you a couple of stories in the Bible because this is one rich person that Jesus speaks to. Jesus speaks to other rich people as well. Jesus dealt with other rich people. The church, the early church dealt with other rich people. I just want to throw a sampling, just a few thoughts at you about a few of those people. Matthew 27, 57. It says, As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. This is the guy who had a, 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 a hole cut out of a stone one day and it was empty, it was a tomb. And then when Jesus was crucified, he went to the Romans and said, can I have the body? And he took the body of Jesus and he wrapped it up and he put it in his tomb. Something that he had used his wealth to dig out, something that he had accumulated. And this rich man went and grabbed the body of Jesus and buried it, put it in the tomb. This guy had become a follower of Jesus, yet I don't see anywhere there, any discourse that's recorded anyway, that Jesus said to him, Arimathea, Joseph of Arimathea, now that you're following me, you need to go and sell everything, including that tomb you've got. Get rid of it. Take it off the list. Whatever reason, he's known as a disciple of Jesus, but he was also a rich person. And it doesn't appear to me that Jesus had a problem with that. In Mark chapter 12, verse 41 to 42, it says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put in, and he watched a crowd putting money into the treasury. Watch this, many who are rich put in how much? Much. He's not trying to belittle them and shame. He's, he's actually saying, you know what, these guys had a lot. But he says, you know what, these rich people went to the treasury and they put much in. It doesn't sound to me like he's got a problem with them. And then go on, keep rolling it, Luke. Then one poor widow came and she threw in two mites, which makes a quadrants, a couple of cents. And then... He called his disciples and he said, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. Jesus wasn't belittling the rich man, wasn't saying there's anything wrong with him. He was just using this, this story, this illustration, to contrast that this woman in her poverty probably percentage-wise gave more than the rich people gave percentage-wise when they gave. That's all he's saying. But he's in no way, shape or form is he belittling the rich people that had the money. He actually is honest. He doesn't say, those suckers came and barely put anything in. And then this poor widow, this poor widow came, she put in everything. Those suckers, they should be ashamed of themselves. They should have put everything. He didn't say that. He just uses this to illustrate. But again, he's not angry. He doesn't seem like there's great animosity against those that had material wealth or possessions. Luke chapter 19, verse 2, we've got the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is a Jew working for the Romans, extracting exorbitant taxes out of his own people. Because he's a Jew working for the Romans, the Jews hate him. Because he's a Jew working for the Romans, the Romans hate him because he's a Jew. So he doesn't have a lot of friends. Anyway, he has this amazing encounter with Jesus. And we know that Zacchaeus was rich. 
How did he get rich? Well, probably not by the best of means. He was ripping people off, left, right and centre. You know, five for me, one for you. Six for me, one for you. Seven for me, you get nothing this time. He was ripping off people. And he acquired a lot of wealth. But then he has this amazing encounter with Jesus. Jesus is sitting in his house, having a meal with him and a bunch of other people. And Zacchaeus jumps up and says, you know what, Lord? Anyone I've ripped off, I'm going to pay him back above and beyond. And I'm going to give back here and I'm going to give back there. Jesus never told him, Jesus is here in the house of a rich person. And Jesus isn't telling him, sitting him down, going, you know what? The one thing I'm interested in is your money. And because you're rich, you must be evil. And you have to get rid of all your money because that's the beginning of purging you of the evil that's in you. Because money is evil. Wealth is evil. Having things is evil. Jesus didn't do that. He's another rich person that Jesus had a great opportunity. He would have been a perfect candidate for Jesus to go, you got rich, ripping people off, you sucker. Go and give it all away. But Jesus doesn't deal with him that way. In Luke 8, verse 1 to 3, we've got an interesting couple of verses. It says that Jesus, as he was traveling about in his ministry, it says that there were a bunch of women that were traveling with him in the group And it says that they actually provided for him out of their own means. So they must have had, whether it was income from a business, whether they had it were married to a a wealthy man, or whether they, they, they sold in marketplaces, we don't know a great deal. What we do know is this, that these women were supporting Jesus financially. So Jesus didn't, obviously, when they brought their first penny to him, go, hang on a second, you got money, you got you got things? If you want to follow me, go and sell them first. Go and get rid of them all, give them to the poor, and then come follow me. He was okay being supported by these people. So I don't think that God has a problem with money or you having being blessed or you having some wealth or, or you having some things. I don't think Jesus has a problem with you having things. Otherwise, we'd have way more records of Jesus actually telling people to sell everything and give absolutely everything away than one person. One person. That's it. One person. And he says, sell everything and give it away. I wonder why. James, chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. James says, if a rich person comes to your church, comes to your gathering... He doesn't say, kick him out. He doesn't say, tell him he can't be genuine, because look at him. You know what he does? He says to the people in the congregation, he says, if you guys treat that person with any more dignity and respect than a poorer person, you're doing the wrong thing. He didn't chastise the rich person for being wealthy or for having a measure of success in life. See, there's nothing wrong with things, nothing wrong with money. Nothing wrong with having some possessions. There's nothing wrong with that. Jesus doesn't have a problem with it. I know certain sections of his people do, though. Have a problem with it. I used to be like that. I used to think when I got saved and I'd see a wealthy Christian, oh, you sucker, you don't care for people. I didn't know how much they gave. I didn't know what they did uh, with what they did have. I I didn't know. I, I knew nothing. All I knew was I would see them with a nice car or dressed nice or hear they had a holiday somewhere. I remember walking down the street one day with a mate of mine and he, we, were, we were handing out pamphlets and he said to me, that house there, da, 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 da. he said, yeah, Christians own that. They've got a pool on their roof. Well, did I go off my nut? Because a Christian with a pool on their roof? How evil! The devil's got your heart! You need to repent! You need to be prayed for! This was my attitude towards anybody that had substance. And then, of course, it's not helped by the extreme prosperity doctrine that floats around the church, where it all becomes about that. Everything is about money. Everything is about possessions. Everything is about things. It doesn't help. There's this extreme at one end, but we've got to understand, too, sometimes in our own hearts, there's an extreme at the other end, too. And we value and we add more dignity to the poor person than we do to the the person that may have a measure of success in this life because maybe they've been wise. Maybe they've managed their finances well. Maybe maybe the character of God has been implanted on them to such a degree that at work they were recognised because they were integrous and honest and did a great job and worked as if they were working under the Lord. And when you're that kind of a person, what happens? Well, you naturally get recognised. 
and opportunity comes and before you know it, their pay grade's going up and they're earning more money. Should that person feel ashamed of themselves? Should they go to their boss and go, no, 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 I won't take the $200,000. No, 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 I'm a Christian. Just give me 20 and a fuel card. <laughs> the occasional donut. Does God have, does God tell everyone to give away everything? I think the answer is clear, no. There's many more places I could take you, but for time, that's it. Question number two, does God have a problem with disciples having material possessions? Does he have a problem with you having material possessions? Sections of the church do, but God doesn't. You know, when I was a young missionary, when I first uh, went to India, this is before uh, me and my wife were married, and I went over there as a single guy, and I was never coming back from India. And my dad shares this story with me one day. He was uh, downtown at a shopping center, and my dad was not a believer. Um, I don't know where he stands at the moment. He's, he's walking a journey. But he went down to a shopping center, completely unchurched at this stage of his life, and bumped into somebody who was a board member of a particular church that was supporting me financially as I was on the mission field. And this board member said to my dad, yeah, we support, they were supporting me $86.32 a month. That's what I was living on basically over there in India, which is fine, I didn't care, it didn't bother me, you know. But my point is this, my dad bumped into this person and this person said to my dad, yeah, we, 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 we were thinking about putting a few dollars extra on there, but we're not going to. Because he needs to know what it's like to live on the poverty line. Now you can imagine what my dad thought about that. He doesn't know Jesus, but he knows his son and he loves his son. His son's in the other side of the world. And here's this person pushing their trolley cart, jumping back in their car, driving home to their house. We just think he needs to know what... Why? Why do, why do I have to know what it's like to live on the poverty line? A, poor woman, you've got no idea what my background is like. I don't come from affluence. My, my dad standing there, he didn't come from affluence. And he knows that his son didn't come from an affluent background. But what a stupid thing to say. Where was the glory for God in that moment? All, all, all she was doing was saying to him that this is God. God. God loves his children to be impoverished. God takes no pride in the prosperity and blessing of his kids. He just wants us all to be poor. Terrible thing to say. In Luke chapter 15, verse 17, there's a very interesting insight that we get into this thing called prosperity, wealth, having stuff, call it whatever you want. The prodigal son, we all know the story, the prodigal son, he goes away, he says to his dad, give me my inheritance, he gets it all, he disappears, he goes and just wastes it all on ungodly living. One day he's there and he's this Jewish boy, good Jewish boy feeding pigs, feeding pigs in another man's farm. And he has this moment where he decides, you know what, I've had it all, wasted it all, and it's not working. And he comes to his senses, and look at this. He says, when he came to himself, what's the first thought he had? How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. What an interesting thing. The very first thing he thought about when he began that journey, the thought that got him on the path to return to his father was this the way the father provided for those in his household he could have thought of a thousand things but the thing that got him motivated to go back on the journey was he said you know what my father's servants have enough and then some on top to spare sounds very unspiritual but this is what he's saying. He's saying, my father's servants are provided for by their father, not just for themselves, but there's enough on top of that to spare as well. That, that to me looks like some kind of blessing, tangible physical blessing that he recognized. And he said, based on that, he began his journey, went, man, I've got to go back because my father provides for these people. My father looks after these people. I want to get back in there because he looks after them. Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. He didn't say seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and I'll keep you bowed down in poverty. On the odd occasion, I might give you a piece of bread. And don't you dare whinge about it, sucker. Be thankful. Yeah, it's weird. Sometimes we think this way about God. We have these un, unthought up theologies about finance and money. I don't think God has a problem at all with money. See, God doesn't just plop blessing on you, but here's the thing. As you get closer to him and your character changes, 
You get opportunity. One of the things God does is he gives you this thing called wisdom. And wise people learn how to turn $2 into $4. And people that work hard turn $4 into $8. And $8 into $16. And, and, and it's just a byproduct of being wise, of being studious, of being transformed. Instead of being lazy, being a lazy person, all of a sudden you become a hard worker. Guess what? There are just natural consequences and benefits in life for those people. So it's not like God just opens a can in heaven and pours a billion dollars on you. You've got to be wise. You've got to work hard and so on. But you know what? When you do, when you start being prosperous and being blessed, don't feel bad about it. God, God doesn't say that that's wrong at all. Does God have a problem with disciples having material possessions? I don't believe that he has. Ecclesiastes 5.19 says this, Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil... This is a gift from God. This is a gift from God. You've worked hard and you've got a, a house and a car and a few toys and a boat that you like to go fishing on and some fishing rods and a PlayStation or whatever. You know, this is a gift from God. Nothing would make me more frustrated than at Christmas time to have my children around the tree and to give them gifts and have them unwrap the gift and then look at it and go, oh, don't know if I deserve that. I shouldn't have that. I want them to get excited and enjoy the gifts that I give them. It brings me great joy when my kids actually enjoy the gifts that I give to them. And I think it gives God great joy when we enjoy the gifts that he gives to us. Don't feel bad about having some gifts from God. Don't feel bad about working hard and earning some money. Don't feel bad because you've saved well. Don't feel bad because you, you might have upgraded your car or bought a house. If you're feeling bad about all that stuff, you're missing the point. Question number three. Then why did he tell the rich young ruler to give it all away? I'm going to give you one of the most profound intellectual theological answers to a question you're ever going to hear in your life. Are you ready? Why did God tell this man to give his stuff away? Ready? Because it was the answer to his question. <laughs> wow. I'm good. I am good. Eh? More people should be listening to me. This man ran up to Jesus. He said, what must I do? What do I lack? And so Jesus answers. <laughs> I just find it funny when I read it to myself. Jesus is just simply answering this man's question. His question that he asks. Jesus didn't chase this man. Jesus didn't go, where's a rich man? I'm going to find me a rich man. Give everything away and sell it. Give it to the poor. Jesus didn't go chasing a rich man and find a rich man so that he could make this point so that we would all know that if you're rich here, this is what I would do to you if you were rich and I was here. I'd come up to you and I'd tell This man came to Jesus for advice. This man who had everything, money, possessions, position, power, youth on his side, even loved God, Ticked the religious boxes, but he knew there was something missing in his life. He knew there was a depth to his existence that wasn't met yet. And so he comes to Jesus with this very simple question, and Jesus answers his question. The answer, he said, you're not following me. And you know why? Because all your riches have got you. We focus on go sell everything and give to the poor. And we stop there as a church. And we, 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 we do Christian beatdowns on each other about it. We write books and we, 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 we push that on everybody. Should sit, and we focus there. You know what? That wasn't the end of what Jesus said, was it? He said, go sell everything and give it to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. In other words, you, what, you're missing something and you're looking for what that thing is. The thing is this. You're not fully following me. And you know why you're not fully following me? Because you've got these things. You don't, you don't, this man didn't have a single dollar. The single dollar had him. He knew he was missing something. 
He knew that, that there was a lack in his life and Jesus gives him the answer. The answer at the end of the day is this, follow me. And if that's stopping you following me, then it becomes wrong. It, why, why was it not wrong for Joseph of Arimathea to be rich? It wasn't stopping him following Jesus. Why, why did James not rebuke the guys that came to the church with riches? Well, because they were still gathering. I'm, I'm assuming they were still walking with the Lord. It wasn't stopping them coming. But it stopped this young man. He didn't have possessions. His possessions had him. You know the hard thing about this story? How do you know if your possessions have you? Here's the reality. I don't think any of us will ever know until Jesus tells us to give them up. We could sit here and I could say right now, hands up, if you, we could have a big Yahoo time. But the truth of the matter is this. The disciples that were on that boat that day when Jesus said, let's go to the other side and the storm whipped up. And all of a sudden they're screaming and Jesus is asleep on a pillow. I think it's Mark 4. He's asleep on a pillow. And the disciples wake up Jesus and they accuse him of not caring. Don't you care that we're perishing? We all know the story. Jesus jumps up and he calms the storm. But then he rebukes the disciples because he didn't want to calm. They should have been able to handle that storm. This is what the reality of it. They should have did what he did, followed him and had to lay down instead of waking him up. You know, you would think after he calmed the storm, Jesus would be excited. Thank you, boys. You gave me a chance to do another miracle. But he wasn't excited. He said, you missed the point. You should have curled up next to me on, on, on the boat and you should have had a sleep. We were going through that. We could have gone through it. Here's the thing. The storm didn't produce the unbelief in their life. The storm just simply was an environment that brought what was already there to the surface. The unbelief was already there. Just when times were good, you didn't see it. Bit of pressure, boom. But the storm didn't create it. That's why it's so hard to say right now at the end of a message like this, let's all just pray that we don't... None of us are really going to know until Jesus maybe comes along one day and says to you, like he said to this man, Jesus didn't say it to everybody, and maybe he won't say it to you. But here's a question for you. If you were ever bold enough to ask Jesus the question, what do I still lack? What's holding me back or slowing me down from following you? What do you think he would say to you? What do you think he'd say to you? Forget what he said to the rich man. You know why? Because he said it to the rich man. But if you were bold enough to ask Jesus the question, what's holding me back? from going 100%? What's holding me back from being a radical disciple? What's holding me back from following you with everything? Is it, it, maybe it's possessions. Maybe it's comfort. Maybe it's the security of life here. M maybe it's popularity. Maybe it's position. What will people think if they hear that I'm a Jesus freak? I don't know the answer to your question. I'm still working out the answers to mine. But I'm grateful to Matthew, Mark and Luke that I got the answer to this man's. Go and sell everything you got. Give it to the poor. I think one of the reasons why we don't want to ask God that question is because we're actually afraid that if we ask him that question, he will take it from us. So we don't even want to ask the question. Lord, would... would. I was reminded this week... Uh, Daniel, I want to just jump up on the guitar and I'll finish up. I'm just going to pray for us. We'll finish up. I was reminded this week about the story of Abraham. Anyone remember the story of Abraham when he went to sacrifice his only, uh, his, his son? Remember that story? And, and it says that he, it's in Genesis. It says that he grabs his son who God promised to him. And God told him, you're going to be a multitude like Santa. I mean, this, this, is, the, this is the kid. And through him, there's going to be generations. And he went up on the top of a mountain with his son carrying sticks because they were going to do, do a sacrifice. And I can't imagine the reality of psychologically what went on in his son's mind. I've often thought about that. This must have been crazy. So anyway, they get up on the top of the mountain and when they get there, somehow Abraham binds up his son and the sticks. And Abraham, this father, picks up a knife picks up a knife 
And, and, and the, 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 the writer of Genesis says that he actually raises that knife above his only son. That is radical commitment to God. I can't imagine it. I've got three sons, a daughter. I can't imagine it. I've got to be honest. I would have probably been like the rich young ruler and turned around and walked away because I love my kids too much. But the amazing thing is that he raises the knife and he goes to bring it down. And then it says this. It says that God spoke to him. And God says this to him, says, stop. Now I know. Now theologically, what does that mean? That God doesn't know things? I don't know. Don't want to get into that. My point is this. There was a point where God said, okay, don't. Because at the end of the day, it's not about your son. It's about your heart. And I know I've got your heart now. And if I've got your heart, I've got everything else. If I need it, I'll tell you. It's amazing what God will do in our life to get to what he really wants, which is simply your heart. God wanted, Jesus wanted this man's heart, not his possessions. Didn't want his money, his stuff. God wants our heart. And anything in our life that captures our heart and holds it back from Jesus. Anything. That's the stuff that if we're serious and we want to grow in discipleship and we humbly come to Jesus, just like this man did, we come to God, we open ourselves up and we want to go on that discipleship journey. We say, Lord, what do I lack? He's faithful. He'll speak to us and he'll show us. Because he wants our heart. I don't think God cares whether you're rich or poor. Does he care what you do with it? Yeah, but that's for another time. Possessions are nothing. I have it under really good authority. I've never been there. Someone told me when you get to the gates of heaven and you go through customs that they take everything away from you. (laughs) They just give you a boarding pass. That's it. You're even naked. You can't take it with you. It's not going to be there with Jesus in heaven. So he's not that overly consumed and interested in it right now. Your heart and you, you're going to be there. That's why he's so passionately interested in that right now. Let's just close our eyes for a second. I want to take that one step further next week. We're going to expand a bit more on some other stuff. But for now, I want you to know this, that, that, that God wants your heart. Not, not, not to destroy you. You, you. If you could just catch a glimpse of the life he has for you. If you could just experience and dip your toe in, in the life that he has planned for you. You wouldn't want anything else. If you could... Feel and experience the love that he has for you greater than any love that any human being could ever have for you. We don't know what this man's life would have looked like had he said, yes, Lord. But I wonder whether as Jesus hung on that cross and he heard the story, whether he had any regret. He was a good man, good guy, wanted to follow God, tick the religious boxes, but just didn't want to surrender it all and follow Jesus.